Last month, I launched a new series on my channel called Holy Book. <laughs> which will consist of standalone scholarly primers on specific questions about the Bible. The first episode asked, who wrote the Gospels? But while I was working on the finishing touches, Inspiring Philosophy beat me to the punch when he dropped this. In the first century, were the Gospels entirely anonymous, and only when they were criticized, did second century Christians add names to give them more authority? Or are there good reasons to think the Gospels really did come from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? We've got dueling videos, so put on your flippers and your goggles, because this is going to take a deep dive. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. And today, that's Michael Jones's Who Wrote the Gospel video. Because it's denser than a Christmas fruitcake, it will take a while to unpack. And because I've been in heavy gospel research mode, I was excited when friend of the channel, Camille Greger, volunteered to help take up the charge. All right, let's see it. According to the consensus of New Testament historians today, there is no reason to think the Gospels were written by the men they were attributed to. Bart Ehrman says, there were some books, such as the Gospels, that had been written anonymously, only later to be ascribed to certain authors, who probably did not write them. Apostles and friends of the Apostles, David Carr and Colleen Conway say, all four of the canonical Gospels were originally anonymous. It was only in the second century CE, when the four Gospels were published as a collection, that the superscriptions were added to the Gospels, attributing authorship to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John respectively. Dale Martin says, We believe that all four Gospels were originally published anonymously, and the names they now bear were given to the four books later in order to link the books to disciples of Jesus, or close disciples of disciples of Jesus. There's a couple of clarifications that I want to make before we begin. First, it's important to unpack what saying that the four canonical Gospels were originally anonymous entails, and to distinguish between several different questions. The question of how Gospel manuscripts were titled is distinct from the question of Gospel authorship. For example, some scholars have held that the Gospel of Mark was actually written by a person named Mark, but it doesn't automatically follow that these scholars also subscribe to any particular theory about who this Mark was. A student of Christian apologist Mike Lacona have recently written a study in which he counted how many biblical scholars believe that the Gospel of Mark was written by Mark and how many believe that Peter is a source behind that Gospel. And those two sets only have a partial overlap. Second, there's a separate question about motivation behind the first usage of the surviving Gospel titles. Michael calls the hypothetical 2nd century editors responsible for them forgers, which entails a malicious intention to deceive. He asks us to believe that they would engage in a sophisticated risk-reward analysis about which apostolic figures should be identified as the authors to maximize the amount of people who would be duped into converting to Christianity. But I advanced a hypothesis that they were not fakers, but they were actually apologists, just like him, and that they were honestly trying to engage in historical speculation to determine who might have written these texts as best as they could. And in this video, I'm going to give you extant examples of ancient Christian writers doing exactly that. And third, I should point out that I personally don't have any issue with the idea that the traditional gospel writers actually were literary authors of some sorts of texts. This is paradoxically a product of sort of a horseshoe theory of biblical scholarship. See, I don't think there is a particularly good reason to believe that, for example, Peter or John actually were fishermen from rural Galilee. And that actually eliminates a lot of the arguments against them being literary authors. I can totally see that Mark, a translator for Peter, wrote down Peter's preachings that he remembered, which would be a text that we no longer have, that Matthew wrote down a collection of dominical oracles, something like Q, that John is the author of a text that was eventually incorporated into the Gospel of John, or that there was a now lost account of Paul's travels written down by his actual companion in the first person. And that's where the so-called we passages in canonical acts came from. I also have no issue accepting external authorial attestation, even if it's relatively late. For example, in the early 5th century, Pope Innocent I wrote that a book known as Acts of Andrew was written by philosophers Senocharides and Leonidas. I agree with scholars who think this is correct, 
and so I believe that the Acts of Andrew do have known authors. One of the reasons the traditional authorship of the Gospels is denied is because none of them internally mention an author, either in the preface or main body. Thus, the Gospels are by definition internally anonymous. But that doesn't mean they ever circulated without names attached to them. In 2019, Simon Gathercole wrote an important paper where he points out a lack of claim of authorship internally is entirely irrelevant to the question of the Gospels anonymity. The reason being is many ancient works were also internally anonymous. In fact, Elmer Herkimer noted that this practice of an author leaving their name out of the body of their work was the standard norm. If we look specifically at the genre of ancient Greco-Roman biographies, of which the Gospels fit nicely with, we can see it was common to write biographies internally anonymous. Thus, given this survey, Gathercole says, the absence of the evangelist names should excite no comment at all. Such an absence is not remotely a curious feature. In other words, given the cultural context, we should expect the Gospels to be internally anonymous. And so the argument the Gospels do not eternally identify the authors is not actually evidence they were known as anonymous works. I thought it would be nice to start with a point of agreement and acknowledge that when it comes to this specific aspect of the debate, Michael and the scholars he's citing are absolutely correct. Michael references an article in which Simon Gavikol responds to several scholars who think that the strict internal anonymity of the Gospels, meaning the Gospel authors never explicitly identify themselves by name in the text, is surprising. This is a good opportunity to highlight that there is no division between Christian scholars and so-called skeptics. To my knowledge, all the scholars who are referenced by Gavikol as subscribing to Gospel anonymity are practicing Christians. And one of the reasons they give for why the Gospels were written anonymously is that this was a way for the authors to indicate that they were merely working as wills of the Holy Spirit. For example, Gurt Oland wrote, In my opinion, it is beyond doubt that all the Gospels were published anonymously. Our present opinion about their authors dates from information which derives from the time of Papias or later. Gurt Oland has a gravestone with a huge inscription which literally says Hic expectat resurrectionem or here he awaits the resurrection. As I mentioned, Gadakol correctly points out that an ancient history or biography, which is what he uses as comparanda to the Gospels, failing to explicitly name its author in the text is no indication of whether the author was identified by name in the title of the work or not. That being said, the list of specifically ancient Greek and Latin historians and biographers who do positively identify themselves by their name in the text is quite a bit longer than what Catechol reports. For example, he doesn't include Apian of Alexandria for some reason, but much more importantly, explicit identification of the author by their name in the text was perfectly common in ancient Christian biographies. Uh, you might think that Catechol doesn't include them because they post-date the Gospels, but that can't be the case, because he also discusses biographies written by late ancient philosopher Porphyry, who is contemporary or even later than some of these Christian biographies. There are at least eight extant ancient Christian biographies in which the author explicitly identifies himself by his name in the text, in some cases more than once. You can see the subjects of the biographies and the authors on screen. But what's important is not that, for example, the author of the Gospel of Mark doesn't say, as for my name, it is Mark, a disciple of Peter. It's that the author never acknowledges that he has access to eyewitness testimony in any way. Some biblical scholars and all Christian apologists want to place the canonical Gospels into the same category of literature as ancient Greco-Roman historiographical works. They want to say that Mark or Matthew fundamentally pursued the same literary project and conducted similar historical investigation as Thucydides or Tacitus. But ancient historians and biographers, of course, do proactively and explicitly state that they have access to eyewitness testimony, either their own or of their sources, when they do. To illustrate how common this was, I put together a collection of passages from ancient histories and biographies, in which the author talks about himself and about his access to eyewitness testimony. I only selected one passage per author, and yet there's still way too many examples for us to go over. So I'm just going to keep talking, and the video will move through the passages in a slideshow. Uh, feel free to pause it to read any given passage. The examples I collected cover both Greek and Latin authors, both historiographers and biographers, both Jewish and non-Jewish authors, and they in fact cover almost the entire canon of surviving Greco-Roman historical and biographical works. Additionally, there are several lost historians whose works only survive in fragments, and yet we still have it attested that they identified themselves as eyewitnesses in their lost works. And again, 
ancient Christian historians and biographers also explicitly state access to eyewitness testimony when they have it. This practice was so common that we have even examples of fictional eyewitnesses or even fictional historians who function as eyewitnesses. There are some known counterexamples, but those exist for reasons that are not applicable to the Gospels. Julius Caesar refers to himself in the third person in his commentary, except for one passage, and Xenophon apparently wrote his Anabasis under a pseudonym. In both cases, this is because they are the main characters, and their works continuously describe their own military victories and other accomplishments, so it would be perceived as too self-congratulatory for them to constantly refer to their successes in the first person. This would only be comparable to the Gospels if they were written by Jesus himself. There are also some fragments of lost histories in which the author refers to himself in the third person. For example, 3rd century general Herennius Dexippus. But because we don't have their works preserved, we don't know whether the author identified himself elsewhere in the text, just like, for example, Polybius or Josephus do. Notably, Dexippus is stylistically modeling his Scythica on Thucydides, which is evident, for example, from the title of the work itself. It's an account of incursions of the Goths into Greece, and yet Dexippus is being deliberately anachronistic by naming them Scythians, because that's how Thucydides referred to Eastern European nomads almost 700 years earlier. And even though the Scythians and the Goths were about as closely related as the Iranians and the Germans are today. And of course, the first two words of Thucydides' history are famously Hukydides at Henaios. The only ancient narrative works in which the authors are as silent as the authors of the Gospel of Mark and Matthew are works which have no access to eyewitness testimony. For example, works describing very distant past, like histories of the foundation of Rome, or very late biographies of poets, which are often largely built from autobiographical statements in the poet's own works, or works of historical fiction, for example, the Alexander Romans, or various lives of Aesop, or some ancient novels. It's difficult to overstate how significant this observation is for the question of gospel authorship. Greco-Roman historians and biographers who conduct actual historical investigation and who do have access to eyewitness testimony consistently write entirely differently from how Mark or Matthew are written. This is the real problem of gospel anonymity. If the Gospels followed the same literary practices as ancient historiography, we would absolutely expect the Gospel of Mark to say, and Jesus saw Simon who gave this testimony, or the Gospel of Matthew to say, and he saw a man named Matthew, the author of this account. Explicit declaration of eyewitness testimony is of course also very common in later Christian apocrypha. We know of some 20 ancient apocryphal works in which the author explicitly communicates access to eyewitness testimony in the text. Uh, you can see their titles on the screen. So why is it the case that these writings conform to what we expect to see in Greco-Roman historiography better than two of the canonical Gospels? Well, it's because they were written later, at a time when it became important to establish apostolic authority. It's not surprising that it's precisely the two earliest Gospels, Mark and Matthew, that make absolutely no mention of having access to eyewitness testimony. It's only late writings that protest too much and start saying things like, I, Simon Peter, and Andrew, my brother, took our nets and went to the sea. Or, the man who saw it has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you may also believe. You know, and stuff like that. We also see this development in a different genre. What we think of today as ancient Christian churches were actually just civil associations, institutionally no different from other ancient cultic or even professional, ethnic or neighborhood associations. And these kinds of associations often had written bylaws or statutes which uh, clarified practical organizational matters, included ethical rules of conduct, conditions of expulsion and so on. We even have some of them preserved in inscriptions. For example, what you're seeing on your screen right now are bylaws of a cultic association that worshipped the gods Asclepius and Hygieia, or health. The earliest surviving Christian example of this genre is the so-called Didache, 
It's certainly a literary creation, and so it's closer to an ecclesiastical treatise than actual articles of association, but it might have been derived from real bylaws that were at some point used by a specific Christian association. It's not surprising that the earliest known example is anonymous, and it's also not surprising that later, when it became important to establish apostolic authority, we suddenly start getting all kinds of church orders which are insisting very strongly that they are in fact written by the apostles themselves. Uh, For example, the apostolic church order, the apostolic constitutions, or the Didascalia Apostolorum. If the four canonical gospels were really written by their traditional authors, it's entirely inexplicable why Mark and Matthew never acknowledge that they have access to eyewitness testimony in any way. But Luke and John do. In fact, I would say that if Mark and Matthew really are both accounts of one person's eyewitness testimony, their total silence about this is entirely unparalleled in all known ancient Greco-Roman historiographical and biographical literature. And if not, the ratio of typical versus exceptional cases is going to be something like a hundred to one against Mark and Matthew. But if the Gospels are not based on eyewitness testimony, this pattern of initial absence and later presence of eyewitness witness claims in the four Gospels is entirely unsurprising, and it fits exactly into the development of early Christian literature. But what are the claim that the four Gospels were not attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John until the second century? Well, there are many reasons to think their titles were actually original. First, the Gospels would have needed to be identified when copies were added to private library collections of the various churches, so it is likely they came with some form of external title to identify them just as it was the case with other ancient works. Here, we have not just one, but two false dichotomies. First, a title was not the only means of identifying an ancient work. Other options include, most importantly, the insipid or the opening words. And second, it's obviously not the case that a title must necessarily include the name of the author. There is, of course, no shortage of ancient works that were either identified via their insipid or they had a title, but their author is not known. This includes, for example, several books of the Bible. And we can also see that before the surviving titles of the canonical Gospels were first used, other Gospel texts had titles that didn't include the author's name either. The Marcionite Gospel was just titled Evangelion, good news, and Marcion didn't attribute it to any author. Irenaeus claims that the Valentinians titled a Gospel text the Gospel of Truth. Much later, we see the same phrase in the insipid of one Naghamadi text, which is lacking a title, by the way. And of course, other ancient Christians had no problem referring to gospel texts without naming an author. For example, to the gospel according to the Hebrews. The Dead Sea Scrolls community didn't seem to attach authors' names to their parabiblical writings either. They just used titles like the community rule. And many other Naghamadi texts don't have any known authors. Instead, they are just called the exegesis of the soul or the wisdom of Jesus Christ. And there is actually some evidence that the canonical Gospels originally had these kinds of titles. Specifically, the first verse of the first chapter in the Gospel of Mark is not a sentence. It doesn't have any word. It says, Arche tu evangeliu Jesu Christu, or the origin of the good news of Jesus the Messiah. That's a title. Similarly, the first verse of the first chapter in the Gospel of Matthew isn't a sentence. It says, Biblos geneseos Jesu Christu, huiu David, huiu Abraham or the book of the origin of Jesus the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. That's a title. And we even see some evidence that before gospel titles were standardized in the second century, the title of this anonymous book was unstable. The Didache, which I've already mentioned, refers to material appearing in the Gospel of Matthew, but it cites it as To Evangelion to Curiu Hemon, or the Good News of Our Lord. That's a title. Similarly, when Justin Martyr uses material which we can recognize in the canonical Gospels, he calls it Apomneumoneumata ton Apostolor, which is usually translated as Apostolic Memoirs. And he actually repeats this specific phrase so many times that some scholars think this is a book title. Apomneumoneumata is a technical term, and it appeared relatively frequently in book titles. For example, Xenophon famously wrote Apomneumoneumata, Socrates, or Memoirs about Socrates. What Justin is referring to might have been a gospel harmony or just a different mix of stories and sayings of Jesus, something like the Edgerton Gospel or the recently published Oxyrhynchus Papyrus 5575, which includes material known from the Gospels of Matthew, Thomas and Luke. 
This is because Justin uses material that isn't coming from any of the four canonical gospels, and some of it also found its way into various apocryphal writings. For example, he says that Jesus was born in a cave, which we can also see, for example, in the infancy gospel of James. He also gives a quotation of Jesus' words that doesn't appear in any of the four canonical gospels. Um, he quotes the voice from heaven heard during Jesus' baptism as reciting Psalm 2-7, uh, which is also not in the four canonical gospels and stuff like that. And Justin never specifies that only some of his information about Jesus came from apostolic sources. For him, these are just other things that he knows about Jesus from, and I quote, apostles and those who followed them. Just to give you one example, Justin says, and I quote, when Jesus had gone to the river Jordan, where John was baptizing, and when he had stepped into the water, a fire was kindled in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, the Holy Ghost lighted on him like a dove, as the apostles of this very Christ of ours wrote. Okay, so the Jordan River caught on fire. Where is this in the New Testament? Nowhere. And where else does it show up? Oh, for example, in the Gospel of the Ebionites. It's also interesting to note the difference between how Justin refers to these apostolic memoirs and how he refers to the book of Revelation. In the latter case, he identifies the author as, and I quote, a certain man with us whose name was John, one of the apostles of Christ. Justin gives absolutely no indication that this John is also supposed to be one of the authors of these apostolic memoirs, and he never names the authors of these memoirs like he names the author of Revelation. And it's of course easy to explain this difference. Justin knew the name of the author of Revelation because the author of Revelation names himself in the text. Now, the obvious question is, if the Gospels were already differentiated by their insipids or by titles that didn't include the name of the author, why was this superseded by the currently used titles? And the answer lies in the specific title formula that was used. Various Gospels, and not just the four canonical Gospels, are titled using the Greek preposition kata plus a noun in the accusative case. So, according to Philip, or according to the Hebrews. In titles of ancient literary works, this specific formula was used for version control. It was used to differentiate between several existing versions of the same text. In all known instances, the formula was not applied by the author, but by someone else later. There are many different examples of this practice. The first is the poetry of Homer. Textual critical alterations of the works of Homer were done already by ancient readers. Most typically, some verses were excised because they were considered inauthentic. Different people, of course, had different ideas about what was inauthentic, which resulted in various different versions of the epics. So the formula was used to differentiate between these versions. Another example are medical texts. Owners of their manuscripts made, again, alterations to the text, for example, corrections, notes, and so on. Medical works were probably more susceptible to this because the genre is very practical. And again, the formula was then applied to differentiate between multiple versions of the same work produced by different manuscript owners. And last but not least, we also see it applied to differentiate between various Greek translations of books found in the Hebrew Bible. Now, uh, I know that Michael thinks there's a valid counterexample to this in 2nd Maccabees, but there actually isn't. 2nd Maccabees includes a letter which mentions records according to Nehemiah. This is sometimes taken to be a reference to the biblical book of Nehemiah, but the letter is about Judas Maccabeus founding a library after the sacking of the Jerusalem temple by Antiochus Epiphanes. And it's clear from context that the records that are being referred to are books in the library that Nehemiah created, not the biblical book of Nehemiah. The reason why all four Gospels have titles with this specific formula is because at some point in the mid-2nd century, an editor, probably in Rome, collected the four Gospels and prepared them to be published together. And because the editor was aware that the four Gospels are very similar in terms of content, and in the case of the synaptics, they might, you know, as well be regarded as three textual recensions of one literary work, he uniformly applied this formula to all four of them. The attribution to the four authors then became accepted in Rome. It spread from Rome through personal and literary contacts and through manuscript copying, and all extant references to the four authors, both in surviving manuscripts and in other literary works, result from this editorial decision. And just to be clear, 
That doesn't mean that the editor didn't honestly believe that the four names he chose were names of the actual authors. The point is that in all cases, when we see this formula being used in titles of ancient works, it's always applied by someone other than the author in order to differentiate between several already published and already circulating versions of the same text. So Mark sitting down and writing a text titled According to Mark would make about as much sense as writing a text titled First Maccabees. That's a label that was applied later. But if the existing titles were added later by an editor, that would be perfectly consistent with how that title formula is used everywhere else in ancient literature. There might be an additional indication that the titles are a product of an editorial decision. Many scholars, again including Christian scholars, argue that the Gospel according to Luke and the Acts of the Apostles are two books of a single two-volume work but volumes of the same literary work in antiquity usually had fairly uniform titles, something like book one or the first book. It seems that what happened in this case is that an editor took a two-volume literary work, both written by and dedicated to one person, separated the two books and gave the first book a title consistent with the other three Gospels. This resulted in the Gospel according to Luke and the Acts of the Apostles having two very different titles. Again, if the titles are original, this would be very anomalous, but if they are a product of a later editorial decision, they become entirely unsurprising. Second, it is unlikely the Gospels would have circulated without names attached to them. For example, the prologue of Luke's Gospel indicates it was sent to someone named Theophilus. It is inconceivable the Gospel would have been sent to him without Theophilus knowing who wrote and sent him a copy of a Gospel. It is unlikely he would have just received some anonymous text and considered it authoritative without knowing it came from someone like Luke. As Richard Bauckham said, the author's name would have featured in an original title, but in any case would have been known to the dedicatee and other first readers because the author would have presented the book to the dedicatee. Okay, let me tell you an anecdote from Plutarch to make a point. When Julius Caesar was becoming increasingly unpopular, people in Rome started thinking that, you know, it would be a good idea for him to retire to a farm in upstate Italy. And they started encouraging Marcus Brutus, believed to be descended from Lucius Brutus, who drove out uh, the last tyrannical king of Rome to, you know, do something about Caesar, which he did by murdering him. But because it wasn't exactly possible to incite him to a political assassination openly, scrolls with political slogans started conspicuously showing up in places where Brutus was likely to randomly find them. These scrolls were turbo anonymous. Nobody, apart from their writers, not even their mums, knew who wrote them. No scholar proposes that the Gospels were originally anonymous like that. Of course there were initially people who knew who the gospel authors were, just like there were people who initially knew who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews. What's your point? Of course there were people who knew who wrote the Didache or the letter to Diognetus. We don't. That happens all the time. What I'm arguing is that already in mid-2nd century, Christians had no better idea about who wrote the four gospels than we do today just like they didn't know who wrote Hebrews. Third, when we study the early church writings, we can see there is unanimous agreement among a multitude of witnesses. All agree the Gospels came from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are none that dissent and attribute them to other authors. Even early copies of the Gospels that have survived, that still have a title, attribute them to their respected authors. No Gospel manuscript has ever been found that bears a different name. This is again entirely correct. We also don't have any manuscripts which we would positively know didn't have any title. Eubol mentioned P1, which is a fragment of a codex leaf, most likely from the 3rd century. It has a chapter number above the text of Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, but no title is extant. But this doesn't necessarily mean that no title was present. As far as I know, for example, Bart Ehrman thinks that it had a title above the chapter number in the portion of the manuscript which is unfortunately not preserved. Much more interesting is P66, one of the earliest if not the earliest surviving manuscript with a gospel title. It's been actually suggested that the title, in this case Gospel According to John, was added later and so the manuscript originally didn't have it. When the manuscript evidence is debated, people are quick to point out that we are missing manuscripts with titles before 
late second century, which is, and I'm sure this is a complete coincidence, also when we start getting literary attestation to the surviving gospel titles. But today, I want to emphasize that for a much longer period of time, we are only looking at the manuscript evidence through an incredibly tiny keyhole. There are only four surviving manuscript fragments with gospel titles and with the most probable date before the year 350. P66, which I've already mentioned, P4, P75, and P62. And here's a map showing all the locations that these manuscripts came from. As you can see, it's all clustered in the same part of Egypt. Manuscript evidence tells us nothing about how the Gospels were titled, say, in Spain or in Armenia. And what's also very unfortunate, but not for me, is that we also happened to have a very early manuscript of Irenaeus' Against Heresies, the first literary work which names the four traditional Gospel authors found in Egypt. This is Oxyrhynchus Papyrus 405, dated to about the year 200, so contemporary or even earlier than the only four manuscripts with gospel titles. This one papyrus of Irenaeus' work largely invalidates even this meager evidence from the four Egyptian manuscripts, because we can conclusively show that the only region from which we have early manuscripts with gospel titles is also a region where the first book naming the traditional authors was read and around the same time. Only much later, we start getting some geographic variability with some of the major codices, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and Bizae for Greek, and Bizae and Versalensis for Latin. But these were produced well after Constantine's conversion, when everyone and their mother already thought they knew who the gospel authors were. Just to put this into perspective, these late manuscripts are contemporary or even later than, for example, the Nag Hammadi texts, which with titles like According to Philip or According to Thomas. We only start getting more manuscripts with titles in Latin, Syriac and Coptic in 4th and 5th centuries, literally hundreds of years after the surviving titles were first used. I would also like to point out that on numerous other occasions, Christian apologists invite us to imagine that early Christian communities were incredibly closely knit and well connected, so that, for example, if a member of the Corinthian church had any doubts about Paul saying that Jesus once appeared to 500 brethren at the same time, they were apparently able to hop on a ship, travel to somewhere, Palestine I guess, get in touch with one of the surviving brethren and fact check Paul. Or we are invited to believe that if someone, say in Gaul, invited a healing miracle of Jesus, they would eventually get a personal visit from Simon the Canaanite or a strongly worded letter signed the other apostle Judas, not Iscariot. Uh, let's assume that this is true. In that case, it's not surprising that a piece of information which had literal centuries to propagate would eventually show up in several different regions of the Mediterranean. It is important to note that this unanimous attestation comes from across the whole Roman world, and not simply one region. Multiple authors from different regions all agree the four gospel authors are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But perhaps a skeptic could argue they all got their information from the same source before it spread out. Even if this was true, given that we have cited many second century sources, the original point of the tradition must have been early, for it to have become such a widespread tradition by the second century, meaning it likely originated in the first century, when the gospels were being composed. Let's move to claims about gospel authorship in ancient Christian texts. I think this is a much less poor type of evidence than manuscripts, because there's, strictly speaking, more of it. Also, in the case of literary attestation, we actually do get some geographic variability earlier. It's not all limited to like two towns in Egypt. There are, however, broadly speaking, three types of issues with literary attestation. Issues with independence, issues with uniformity, and issues with reliability. Let's start with issues with independence. The four traditional gospel authors not only appear in titles of surviving manuscripts, but they are also spoken of by various ancient Christian authors. But to what extent are these attestations mutually independent? Is it really true that the same identification of the authors pops into existence separately all around the Mediterranean? What you're seeing on your screen right now is a stemma of literary authors who mentioned Mark being a gospel author before the Council of Nicaea. You know, the council which famously did not vote 
about which Gospels should be included in the New Testament, that decision was actually made by an unknown editor in mid-2nd century. And I'm showing this thema of Mark because it's the earliest Gospel and so it had the most time to accumulate attestation. As you can see, these authors are connected. They are connected either through literary dependence, for example the anonymous work Refutation of All Heresies, falsely attributed to Hippolytus, quotes from Against Heresies by Irenaeus, or they are connected through discipleship, for example Dionysius of Alexandria, studied under Origin of Alexandria, and so on. To my knowledge, what you're seeing on your screen right now are all the known authors who identify Mark as a gospel writer in anti-Nicene literature. Apart from these, the Markan authorship is only mentioned in this period in three anonymous texts, a polemical treatise on the rebaptism of apostates after the Decian persecution in the 3rd century, and the so-called anti-Marcionite and Monarchian prologue to the Gospel of Mark, preserved in some manuscripts of the Vulgate. The date and sources behind the Gospel prologues are difficult to determine, and I've seen dates ranging from the 2nd to the 6th century. The anti-Marcionite prologues are generally considered earlier, and based on verbal agreement, it's been suggested that they are either dependent on Irenaeus or on the same tradition which is cited by Papias. It's also interesting to note that almost all these authors either lived in Rome at some point, or they exchanged letters with Christians in Rome. Both the refutation of all heresies, the anti-Marcionite and the Monarchian prologues were, in all likelihood, also written in Rome. And this is no coincidence. Rome is the most likely location where the surviving gospel titles originate from. They didn't appear independently in many different locations throughout the world. It goes back to an edition of the four gospels published in Rome at some point in the mid-2nd century. And from there, it spread through personal and literary contacts to other Christian communities, for example in Alexandria or Carthage. But also, when we study the traditions, we see variation. Irenaeus and later church fathers suggest the order the Gospels were written in was Matthew first, followed by Mark, then Luke, and then John. But Clement of Alexandria believed Matthew and Luke were written first, then Mark, and then John. So it appears they had different traditions regarding the order the Gospels were written in, which shows us their information was not all coming from the same source. And despite this, we still have unanimous agreement on who the Gospel authors were. So, just to reiterate, Irenaeus and Clement of Alexandria contradict each other when it comes to the order in which the four canonical gospels were written. And this is not the only quote-unquote variation between them. Irenaeus also says that the Gospel of Mark was written only after Peter died. And I think that Irenaeus believed that because, and I agree with him on this, this is the natural reading of what Papias says about Mark's literary activity, i.e. that Mark wrote down whatsoever he remembered from the teachings of Peter. But Clement actually claims that Mark wrote the gospel when Peter was still alive and that Peter knew about it. Clement, reportedly, wrote about this in his work called Hypotiposes, which I've seen translated as outlines. But that work is lost. We only have fragments, mostly in Eusebius. And Eusebius was nice enough to preserve not only what Clement wrote, but also who his sources were. Uh, Eusebius says, and I quote, Clement gives the tradition of the earliest presbyters as to the order of the Gospels. Unfortunately, we don't know who these presbyters are supposed to be. Several candidates have been suggested, but this is where the trail goes cold. Clement, citing a prior source, paradoxically makes the problem worse, because it pushes it further back in time. Normally, you'd think that getting contradictory answers to the same question from contemporary authors should lower your confidence that they have reliable information. But not according to Michael, apparently. I should note that there seems to be something wrong going on with the passage, because Eusebius actually brings it up twice in his ecclesiastical history, and what he says on the two occasions contradicts. In Book 2, he says that when Peter learned about Mark writing the Gospel, Peter, and I quote, was pleased with the zeal of the man, and the work obtained the sanction of his authority for the purpose of being used in the churches. But in Book 6, he says that when Peter learned about it, and I quote, he neither directly forbade nor encouraged it. Uh, there's a couple of things that might be going on here. Maybe Eusebius is just quoting from memory, maybe he's confusing Clement with a different author, which wouldn't be unprecedented for Eusebius, or maybe he's just citation bluffing, which was relatively common in antiquity. It's hard to say more, given that Clement's hypotyposes are lost. I personally think 
and this is just my own speculation, that the two contradictory accounts about the authorship of Mark are not only coming from the same sources, but one is actually an apologetic reaction to the other. The idea that Mark wrote down Peter's preaching only after Peter's death, when Peter was no longer around to sanction it, caused concerns about the Gospel's reliability, and so the Gospel was redated to close off that possibility. Kind of like the author of the Gospel of Matthew invented the story about the guards at Joseph's tomb to combat the body death hypothesis. And just so that we can be completely sure that this is in fact what actually happened, the most apologetic version of the story, the, the one in which Peter is pleased with the gospel and sanctions it, also claims that Peter learned about Mark writing the gospel through a revelation of the spirit. And when it comes to the two contradictory orders in which the gospels were written, I think, and this is again only my personal opinion, that these are two different theories based just on the texts of the Gospels themselves. And some indication of this lies in where exactly the two orders contradict. In both versions, Matthew and John are dated as first and last, which reflects ancient teleological thinking. Christianity grew out of Judaism, so it would make sense for Matthew to be the first and John to be the last Gospel written. Also, ancient authors frequently claimed that John was written last because it's the fullest final revelation of Jesus' divine nature. But there's nothing inside either Mark or Luke that would clearly place one earlier than the other. And so it's not surprising that we see both theories proposed in ancient literature. But speaking of contradictory information, let's move to the Gospel of John. Uh, the stemata of Luke and Matthew look almost exactly the same as what you've already seen. Before Irenaeus, or contemporary with him, a person named John was apparently identified as the author of the Gospel by two Valentinian Christians, Ptolemy and Heraclo. And I would be amiss if I didn't mention that many Christians who are labeled as heretics, particularly the Valentinians, absolutely loved the Gospel of John. And that Johannine material was used by the early Catholic or proto-Orthodox authors conspicuously less often than material from the Synoptics. From that, all kinds of scholars have drawn all kinds of conclusions about the provenance of the Gospel of John. But I'm not going to even mention them, because if there are any apologists watching, it would make their heads explode. So, the Gospel of John has the best chance for early independent attestation. But, ironically, the Gospel of John is also a text that has been attributed to multiple different authors, which brings us to the second group of issues with authorial attribution, namely, issues with uniformity. When we survey the early data, we see unanimous consent that the four Gospel authors are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No one ever claims another author for the four canonical Gospels, and no one ever suggests the Gospels were understood as anonymous. See, it's not actually true that the attestation is unanimous. In the case of the Gospel of John, we see at least four different candidate authors. The question of its authorship is inseparably tied to the question of the identity of the beloved disciple. You know, the disciple who testifies to these things and has written them. Most Christians today seem to accept that the author is John, son of Zebedee. This identification is first made in mid-2nd century in the apocryphal Acts of John. Maybe. And I say maybe because the identification is only made in a speech given by John reserved in one late medieval manuscript where it appears among various other writings. And it's actually not clear whether it's an original part of the Acts of John, and it's not even clear where it's supposed to fit in the Acts. Some modern scholars put it towards the beginning, others towards the end. To my knowledge, an explicit identification of the beloved disciple with John son of Zebedee is first made in Catholic literature by Dionysius of Alexandria in mid-3rd century. But I could be wrong on that. About two generations earlier, Polycrates of Ephesus wrote that the beloved disciple was a person named John who wore pantalon, a part of the priestly attire, meaning that he was a temple priest. And obviously, a priest of the Jerusalem temple and a Galilean fisherman are two different people. This is not a difference in minor details or a unique priestly tradition. These are two entirely separate figures. And it's clear that these contradictory identifications do not go back to any reliable traditions passed from the earliest presbyters, going all the way back to the apostles themselves. Instead, these are just theories about who the beloved disciple might have been, based on the text of the gospel itself. And because the text is ambiguous, different speculators came up with different speculations. It's easy to see why the beloved disciple would be identified with John, son of Zebedee, given that the Gospel describes him as one of the closest disciples and he's differentiated 
from other named figures, like Peter. At that point, it's basically a 50-50 chance that he would be identified with either the two sons of Zebedee's. Maybe more in favor of John, if James was believed to have been martyred early on. The identification with a temple priest seems to be based on John 18.15. After his arrest, Jesus is followed by Peter and another disciple who is not named. The disciple was known to the high priest, and that's why the two of them were allowed to enter the courtyard of the high priest's house where Peter denies Jesus. But why would the high priest know specifically this random disciple of Jesus? Well, because the disciple must have been a temple priest himself, of course. And by the way, this is not just my hot take. Even scholars who do identify the beloved disciple with John, son of Zebedee, think that this is where this other identification comes from. Around the turn of the 5th century, we see Jerome harmonizing the two contradictory speculations by claiming that John, son of Zebedee, was known to the high priest because the Zebedees were aristocrats. But wait, there's more. The anti-Marcionite prologue to the Gospel of John claims that the fourth gospel was dictated to Papias by a person named John, who excommunicated Marcion. But Marcion was active over a century after Jesus' death, and so this John could not have been a disciple of Jesus. And so we have a third contradictory identification. Unless, of course, a disciple of Jesus lived to be like 120 which apparently could have happened. According to Hegesippus, Simeon, son of Clopas, was martyred when he was 120. Anti-Marcionite prologue actually cites the source of its claim about the Gospel of John being dictated to Papias, and the source is supposedly Papias' own writings. If this is true, then we have eyewitness testimony to the origin of the Gospel of John in the middle of the second century. Of course, modern historians are quick to dismiss the author of the prologue as either extremely confused or just lying, but this doesn't exactly raise our confidence in there being reliable records about where the fourth gospel came from. This seems to be a mangled version of the idea that Marcion was prophetically anticipated and refuted in Johannine literature, which is what Tertullian says, or it's based on a story of Marcion meeting Polycarp, a disciple of John, mentioned by Irenaeus, only transferred to John himself. Next, two 4th century heresiologists, Epiphanius and Philastrius, claimed that there were Christians called the Alogoi, named after their rejection of the Logos theology. They maintained that the Gospel of John and the Revelation of John were written by a heretic named Serinthus. Serinthus lived in late 1st and early 2nd century, and seems to be one of the earliest known interpreters of the Gospel of John. Now, there's some debate about whether the Alogoi actually existed. You know, these kinds of neat divisions of heretics into distinct sects is in many cases just a construct created by the heresiologists. Some scholars have tied the Alogoi to Gaius, one of the leaders of the church in Rome in late 2nd century. See, there was a popular Christian movement called New Prophecy or Montanism at the time, and Montanists believed in continuation of prophecy and identified their leaders as the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to send the Paraclete found in the Johannine literature. Um, Gaius of Rome, a representative of Catholic Christianity, apparently combated this perceived heresy by undercutting its apostolic support, throwing the Johannine literature under the bus, and rejecting it as forged in the name of John. But which Johannine writings he rejected as spurious, whether this actually included the Gospel of John or not, whether he is connected to the Alogoi in any way, and who he even was, is again disputed by scholars. Worst case scenario for our purposes, this fourth competing authorship claim is only pushed to the fourth century. Now, some viewers might be surprised to see this lack of clarity about who the beloved disciple and slash or the author or authors of the Gospel of John were supposed to be. But this is actually just one instance of a more general confusion about who was who in early Christianity. For example, Heracleon, Origen, or the already mentioned Didascalia Apostolorum considered Matthew and Levi to be two different people. The late 2nd century Epistle of the Apostles, Clement of Alexandria, or a 3rd century list of apostles and disciples falsely attributed to Hippolytus of Rome treat Peter and Cephas as two different people. 
Similarly, when we look at how the various ancient Greek, Latin, Syriac, and Coptic texts treat the various occurrences of the name Mark in the Book of Acts, the Pseudopoline letters, and First Peter, we see anything between one and three separate figures. For example, a list of apostles and disciples, falsely attributed to Hippolytus, but this time Hippolytus of Thebes, differentiates between Mark the Gospel writer, Mark the cousin of Barnabas, and John Mark. But for example, when Jerome talks about a person named Mark, mentioned in the epistle to Philemon, he says, and I quote, whom I think is the author of the gospel. What do you mean you think? And these are just some of the major figures. When it comes to more obscure apostles, disciples, or early bishops, who is who is again all over the place in writings of ancient Christian authors and various contradictory lists. The situation is maybe even worse when it comes to identification of women. For example, outlining how many Marys there were in early Christianity, which is which, and how they are related to other figures in the New Testament, according to various early Christian authors, would turn this video into a PhD thesis. And those theses, by the way, have of course been written. This shows that the second century and later Christian authors didn't have a very clear picture of the development of Christianity in the first century and that their histories of Christian origins were constructed retrospectively, mainly out of various passages of the Hebrew Bible, which were considered prophetic about Jesus or the apostolic age, and out of biographical information found in various texts that were considered apostolic. And because these kinds of sources are often open to interpretation, we see multiple contradictory versions of early Christian history. Plus, the various other quote-unquote traditions didn't exactly help to form one coherent picture of early Christian history. You know, like Jesus healing a daughter of the high priest in Irenaeus, Judas Iscariot exploding in Papias, Jesus being buried shamefully in the Apocryphon of James, the apostles being told not to leave Jerusalem for 12 years in Apollonius of Ephesus, Jesus' brother James entering the Holy of Holies, according to Jerome's mistranslation of Hegesippus, Saint Pilate converting to Christianity in Tertullian, the Therapeutae being identified as a Christian church founded by Mark, according to Jerome, or the false claim that Josephus attributed the destruction of the Second Temple to the execution of Jesus' brother James, repeated by Origen, Eusebius, or Jerome. But back to the Gospel of John, the lack of consensus regarding its author continues to this day. For example, conservative Christian scholar Richard Bockham, whom Michael mentions, argues that the author of the Gospel is not John son of Zebedee, but a different disciple of Jesus, also named John and that many early Christian writers who identify the gospel author as John actually mean this different John. For example, and contrary to popular belief, Irenaeus doesn't identify the gospel author with John son of Zebedee. He calls him an apostle, but that doesn't narrow it down, because for many Christian writers, the term apostle was not synonymous with how it's used in the gospels. For many of them, Barnabas, for example, was also an apostle. So a person named John being called an apostle doesn't necessarily mean he's supposed to be one of the 12 apostles. But notice that the opposite is not true. When a person named John is explicitly excluded from the group of apostles, that means he's not supposed to be John, son of Zebedee. This is what we see in the so-called Muratorian canon, probably from, from late 2nd century. It identifies the author of the fourth gospel as John, one of the disciples, and goes on to talk about his fellow disciples. But then it mentions Andrew, one of the apostles. The fact that Andrew is identified as an apostle, but John is not, strongly suggests that for the writer of the Muratorian canon, the author of the gospel of John was not John, son of Zebedee. And Richard Bokam is not the only scholar who agrees. Some have run with the idea that Polycrates was right, and the beloved disciple really was a temple priest and they started looking for suitable candidates to identify him with. A popular choice is a person named John, listed as a member of the high priestly family in Acts 4-6. Some speculations are even bolder. You know how in the Gospel of John, Jesus is brought not only before high priest Caiaphas, but also before high priest Annas? Well, I'll let you know that the Gospel of John was actually written by none other than his own son, Theophilus, the high priest between the years 37 and 41. He's of course never named John in any of the known sources, but hey, for all we know, or so the reasoning goes, he used the Hebrew name Yohanan in addition to the Greek name Theophilus, a practice that was relatively common, and it just happens to be the case that nobody recorded this. And then there is of course the suggestion that the list of known high priests of the Second Temple is incomplete, 
and that this John simply managed to slip through the cracks in the historical record. One Italian theologian even suggested that because he was a Christian, this high priest suffered an equivalent of the Roman damnatio memoriae, and he was expunged from the records. In total, various scholars have proposed over 20 different identities of the beloved disciple, including several women. And this includes conservative Christian scholars, by the way. For example, Charles Worth identified him as Thomas, Witherington as Lazarus, and so on. Martin Hengel, whom Michael uses as a mouthpiece for the view that the Gospels have always had the surviving titles, well, he concluded that the beloved disciple is a product of the redactors who put the Gospel of John together and who intentionally conflated features of both John son of Zebedee and a completely different disciple also named John in order to deliberately leave the question of his exact identity open. Fundamental uncertainty about the identity of the beloved disciple is further complicated by the uncertainty about the relationship between the beloved disciple and the author or authors of the gospel. Is the beloved disciple the author or is he a source, either oral or written? The text itself allows multiple interpretations and so again multiple interpretations show up in ancient Christian literature. This is how, for example, the actual gospel writer gets to be either a disciple named John in the Muratorian Canon, Papias in the Anti-Marcionite Prologue, or Prochros in his pseudopigraphal Acts of John, different from the ones I've already mentioned. Moreover, the Gospel of John, as we have it today, is a product of redactional work. The last chapter was very probably added later, and there's internal evidence of redaction elsewhere in the text. For example, Rudolf Bultmann's reconstruction of the various sources behind the Gospel looks like a Jackson Pollock's painting. If you don't like the documentary hypothesis, this will melt your face. This, of course, complicates the question of authorship even further. Assuming the beloved disciple is an actual historical figure, and whoever he or she might have been, are they an author or a source behind one of the redacted sources? Is this or that John one of the later redactors? Is Serenthus one of the redactors? But in any case, if we only go with ancient authorial attestation, we see at least four different authors proposed by the 4th century. Now, can you show me any work from antiquity that was attributed to so many different authors so soon, and yet scholars are still confident that we know who wrote it? I don't know any. Michael implies that scholars who don't subscribe to the traditional gospel authorship engage in some sort of double standard, because other works from antiquity that are considered authentic have their authorship attested less well. As Michael Kona says, the best source attesting Plutarch's authorship is the Lampreas catalog, written more than a century and perhaps more than two centuries after Plutarch's death. Additionally, it is falsely attributed to Plutarch's son. Still, no one questions Plutarchan authorship. I argue that the actual situation with gospel authorship is in fact precisely the opposite of what Michael says. Authorial attribution of extra-biblical works is routinely rejected because of much less severe issues than what we see with the Gospel of John. For example, scholars reject that Plutarch wrote the Lives of the Ten Orators, even though it is included in the Lambrias catalog, which Lacona claims is the best source for Plutarchan authorship. And why do these scholars reject it? Well, it's based on exactly the same methods, which lead critical scholars to reject, for example, the authorship of the pseudo Pauline epistles. And just to be clear, I'm not arguing that the Gospel of John was actually written by Apostle Serenthus, although he would of course be a much more plausible author than a Galilean fisherman. Rather, this highlights that 2nd century and later Christian writers didn't have a very clear idea where these texts came from, and that any particular identification of the author is just a theory, a Bible theory. We know in the 1st century, Paul's letters were circulating between different churches, and whoever was delivering the letters would have been able to verify the letter came from Paul. Likewise, as Gospels were being copied and circulated, the various churches would have requested information on where the Gospel came from. It is unlikely they just would have accepted any old writing without believing it came from a reliable source. This brings us to the third group of issues with authorial attestation, namely issues with reliability. Christian apologists, both modern and ancient, like to paint rosy pictures of how Jesus' disciples continued to function as guarantors of their eyewitness testimony, how there were uninterrupted successions of bishops who carefully preserved this or that tradition, or how no writing could have been accepted unless it came from a known reliable source. 
Well, not only is this wishful thinking, it of course contradicts the actual history of 2nd century Christianity. Just go read Lost Christianities by Bart Ehrman or Found Christianities by M. David Litva. I, I just hope that Litva returned the Lost Christianities to Ehrman after he found them. If it's really the case that Christian communities would not have accepted anonymous gospels, then how did Marcionite Christianity happen exactly? In 140s, Marcion of Sinope published a gospel text, which, as far as we know, he never attributed to any author. He simply referred to it as Evangelion, good news. It was an anonymous gospel. What followed is exactly what Michael says would have never happened. Marcionite Christianity came to be one of the most popular early Christian movements. Marcionite Christians became so numerous that, for example, Cyril of Jerusalem advised his fellow believers who arrived to a new town to ask specifically for the Catholic Church, because if they just said Christian, they might have been led to the Marcionites. Do you think that Christianity suddenly exploded in popularity soon after Jesus' crucifixion? This is how explosive growth looks like. Later in the same century, Epiphanius of Salamis writes about contemporary Marcionites in Rome, Egypt, Palestine, Arabia, Syria, Cyprus, Persia, and other places. Almost a century later, Theodoret mentions a village with over a thousand Marcionite Christians, plus eight entirely Marcionite villages, just in his own Syrian diocese. If there were four biographies of Jesus, plus a history of the early church, written by known apostolic authors in circulation for almost a century before Marcion, then how did he become so successful exactly? What explains that? And why did he not attribute his gospel to any apostolic author? like Peter or Thomas. What explains that? What if, when Marcion came to Rome, no gospel text had a known writer? That would explain it, right? And sure, extant heresiological treatises do attack the Marcionite gospel for lacking apostolic authority, but those were written a generation after Marcion or even later. So the idea that writings without well-documented authors were unacceptable clearly cannot make sense of the actual history of ancient Christianity. Moreover, if it was really the case that information about which texts do and do not have apostolic authorship was carefully curated, we would expect early Christian authors to, you know, get it right. But they don't. I don't have to remind anyone that outside Gospels and Acts, most of the works in the New Testament canon are falsely attributed. The same Christian writers who make claims about who wrote the Gospels are often wrong about authorship of other works. For example, Clement of Alexandria loved the epistle of Barnabas, whom he calls Apostle Barnabas. This false authorship claim is still maintained, for example, by Jerome. Clement also believed that the apocryphal Apocalypse of Peter, the preaching of Peter, and the traditions of Matthias were actually written by Peter and Matthias. His student, Origen, apparently got a memo that the preaching of Peter is inauthentic, but he wasn't so sure, for example, about 2 Peter, which he called disputed. And he, of course, still considered the epistle of Barnabas to be authentic. A disturbingly large number of ancient Christian authors were convinced that Enochic literature was actually produced by the antediluvian figure of Enoch. Tertullian even speculates that its content was either preserved by Noah or God inspired it to be written again after it had been destroyed when the world was flooded. Tertullian supports its authenticity by pointing out that quote-unquote Apostle Jude quotes from it, referring of course to the canonical epistle of Jude. By the way, I think that every once in a while everyone should be reminded why exactly the Epistle of Jude cites the Book of Enoch? It's because the author of the Epistle believed that Enoch, less than a thousand years after the universe was created, spoke prophetically against specific people in Christian churches. And then we of course have various canon lists and New Testament codices, which include various apocryphal works, and slash or luck, various supposedly apostolic works, as well as general comments by the likes of Origen, Eusebius or Jerome about how not all say 2nd and 3rd John are genuine, how James, Jude, 2nd Peter, 2nd and 3rd John are disputed, how some say that the epistle of James, and I quote from Jerome, has been published by someone else under his name, and gradually, as time went on, have gained authority, unquote or how the epistle of Jude is rejected by many 
because it quotes from the book of Enoch, but it's still considered scripture because it has gained authority. And I again quote from Jerome, by age and use, because that's something that can happen, apparently. We also read how the revelation of John is rejected by some, but recognized by others, how the epistle to the Hebrews is rejected by some, because it's disputed by the Church of Rome, how some dispute the shepherd of Hermas, but others consider it quite indispensable, or how most people consider the gospel that the Nazarenes and Ebionites used to be the authentic text of the Gospel of Matthew. Christian authors who wanted to split the authorship of the Johannine literature between two different persons named John, for example Dionysius of Alexandria or Eusebius, sometimes pointed to there being two different tombs of two different Johns still standing in Ephesus. But Jerome mentions some genius harmonizers who just dismissed this by saying that, well, John son of Zebedee just has two tombs. Apostolic authorship of texts wasn't secured by uninterrupted chains of custody. It was assigned mostly by guesswork, based on the texts themselves and, and everyone say this with me, negotiation with the text for the structuring of power. There was a complicated interaction between textual interpretation and historical speculation. In some cases, interpretations were considered acceptable if they were interpretations of texts believed to have apostolic provenance, and in other cases, proposed apostolic provenance of a text was rejected if its interpretation was not found acceptable. For example, Serapion of Antioch, active probably around the turn of the 3rd century, once visited a Christian community in Syria. Its members showed him a gospel written under the name of Peter and told him that it's causing divisions in the community. Serapion didn't even read the gospel, sanctioned its usage and only found out it's heretical after it's been pointed out to him later. He initially either didn't know or didn't care whether this gospel according to Peter was actually written by Peter and he subsequently didn't conduct any historical investigation into its origin. He just got a copy and then determined its apostolic authorship by testing its ideological purity like a political commissar. If information about apostolic authorship was carefully preserved and curated, you would expect to see the earliest authors to have the best information about which writings are genuine, because they were the closest to the apostles. What we actually see is the exact opposite of that. Early authors are generally less reliable when it comes to attributing works to apostolic authors. A consensus about which works are apostolic and which works are not emerges only slowly over several centuries, with the final product having less than 50% success rate. And when it comes specifically to the Gospels, early Christian authors make several claims about their origins which we can actually fact check. And when we do, they turn out to be false. Namely, ancient Christian authors who say something about where the Gospel of Matthew came from, other than that Matthew wrote it, make one of the following claims, usually both. That it was written first, and that it was originally written in Hebrew. Both of these claims are false. The Gospel was written in Greek, and it's a rewrite of the Gospel of Mark. But I want to close this section of the video by looking more closely at one specific ancient Christian writer discussing apostolic authorship. Dionysius of Alexandria, active in mid-3rd century, evaluated the authorship of the Book of Revelation, because he was aware of some Christians before his time who rejected it as written by Serenthus. This is a great opportunity to see how beliefs about authorship of these texts were formed. So, how does Dionysius determine who wrote the Revelation? Well, he says that it is a John that writes these things we must believe, for he himself tells us. Okay, so clearly he has no idea who wrote it, he's just working with what the text itself says. He points out that the author of Revelation repeatedly names himself as the author, but the author of the Gospel of John, who Dionysius thinks is John son of Zebedee, never does. He notices other stylistic differences and concludes by saying, from the character of both and forms of expression and the whole disposition and execution of the book, I draw the conclusion that the authorship is not his. This is a stylometric analysis. This is exactly how Bart Ehrman writes. Dionysius also points out 
that there is this other John, surnamed Mark, in Acts of the Apostles, and wonders whether he is the author of Revelation. He has no awareness of this Mark being Mark the Stubby Fingers, the author of the Gospel of Mark. And neither does Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, or Origen, by the way. They only know this John Mark from the Book of Acts. Dionysius ultimately rejects the idea that Revelation was written by this John Mark, which is a shame, because we could have had the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Mark, and the Revelation of John Mark. So how is it possible that Dionysius doesn't know who the author of Revelation is? Where is the transmission of the information about authorship from one to another in continuous order down to our own day that 5th century apologist Augustine talks about? which is supposed to become more certain over time, not less. So where is it? I argue that there is no reason to believe that someone like Irenaeus or Justin Martyr were in any better position to know who wrote the Gospel of John than Dionysius is when it comes to the authorship of Revelation. In a fragment we have from the early church father Papias, we see he says that Matthew and Mark were Gospel authors. In the rest of this video, I'd like to briefly touch on several miscellaneous aspects of the debate. Let's start with Papias and Irenaeus, because these are the two authors who can be placed at the end of a line of oral transmission of information that reportedly goes back to Jesus' own disciples. And so, the reasoning goes, they would be in a good position to know who the Gospel authors were if the traditional Gospel authorship is correct. It's been frequently pointed out that the two literary works that Papias ascribes to Mark and Matthew are not the two canonical Gospels. In fact, the word Evangelion appears nowhere in the surviving fragments of Papias. I want to point out that we actually have texts that fit Papias' descriptions much better than the two canonical Gospels. Papias says that Mark wrote down everything he could remember from the preaching of Peter and was careful not to omit anything he heard. If this is talking about the Gospel according to Mark, it means either that Peter never talked about the Sermon of the Mount, about the virgin birth, or about Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, including to himself, or that he did, but Mark kind of forgot about it. But we do actually have surviving evidence of collections of apostolic preachings. We have fragments of the already mentioned preaching of Peter. We know that other pseudepigraphal preaching collections also existed, for example the preaching of Paul, but we also have stuff like the Petrine speeches in Acts 2, 3 and 10. It's been suggested that these might come from an existing text, for example, because they function as independent literary units. They are only minimally connected to prior narrative, they don't refer to events unique to look acts and so on. And, interestingly, they sound like speeches that a Christian apologist around the turn of the 2nd century would give, and similar to what we actually see in 2nd century apologetic literature. I propose that Papias identifies Mark not as a gospel author, but as an author of a collection of Peter's teaching, roughly comparable, for example, to the Ancairidion of Epictetus, not the one from the Adventure Time. If this is the case, then it much better explains what Papias actually says. Similarly, Papias doesn't say that Matthew wrote a gospel, but oracles in the Hebrew language. And again, Papias, describing a collection of Jesus' sayings, similar, for example, to the Gospel of Thomas, is a much better explanation of what Papias says. In fact, it's not just a better explanation, it's the best explanation. Additional evidence that Papias is not talking about the canonical Gospels comes from the fact that he apparently had nothing to say about the authorship of Luke and John. That's surprising, especially when it comes to John, because Papias reportedly knew the first epistle of John and heard from companions of Jesus' disciples, including not just one, but two different Johns. So if the Gospel of John was actually written by Jesus' disciple named John, why don't we have a fragment from Papias talking about this, other than, you know, the presumably bogus citation in the anti-Marcionite prologue to the Gospel of John that I've already mentioned? What explains this silence? What if, by the time Papias wrote, Mark, Matthew, Luke and John were not yet known as gospel authors. That would explain it, right? Alternatively, and this has also been suggested, Papias did talk about the authorship of Luke or John, but nobody quotes him because what he said disagreed with later identification of the authors. For example, Papias might have attributed the gospel of John to a different John than someone like Eusebius, and so Eusebius didn't quote Papias on that. Irenaeus, 
tells us the four gospel authors are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Irenaeus is the first known author who names the writers of the four canonical gospels. He is illustrative of two important points. First, he is often identified as a disciple of Polycarp, for example by Jero, and Polycarp was in turn identified as a disciple of John. Which John this is supposed to be is again unclear. Now, you would think that discipleship entails perhaps something similar to what we see in the case of Jesus' disciples in the Gospels. But in this case, Irenaeus himself describes the circumstances of his contact with Polycarp. He says that he saw Polycarp when he was a boy. This shows that various claims about doctrines handed down by the apostles and their disciples, found already in the ancient Christian sources, must be understood in their appropriate context. And that context is a context of apologetics and polemics, with Christians who held beliefs perceived to be incompatible with personal salvation, and who, by the way, made the same kinds of statements. They also put forward books they claimed had apostolic authorship, and, you know, Basilides was a disciple of Glaucias, who was a disciple of Peter, Valentinus was a disciple of Theudas, who was a disciple of Paul, Tatian was a disciple of Justin Martyr, and so on. And second, I want to highlight one specific passage in the second book of Irenaeus' Against Heresies. Irenaeus argues against Christians who were mining biographical details about Jesus out of the Hebrew Bible and argued that the reference to the year of the Lord's favor in the passage of Isaiah, which Jesus reads in the synagogue, is a prophecy about Jesus' ministry lasting one year. Irenaeus counters them with a theological speculation. He reasons that Jesus must have lived through all stages of human life, from infancy all the way to the old age, because if he didn't, his, sal his salvific act wouldn't apply universally to people of all ages. Irenaeus then takes the statement of the Jews from John 8:57, you are not yet 50 years old, and infers that Jesus must have been close to 50 when he died, which would be considered old age back then. He then takes Luke 3:23 which says that Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry, he combines the two Gospels together and concludes that Jesus' ministry must have lasted much longer than one year. QED, heresy refuted. Irenaeus claims that even the presbyters who knew John, a disciple of Jesus, testify that Jesus lived to be almost 50. Moreover, he says that some of the presbyters saw not only John, but the other apostles also, and heard the very same account from them and bear the testimony as to the validity of the statement. This is usually interpreted either as Irenaeus appealing to oral traditions he received from these presbyters, or as him referencing material found in the work of Papias without explicitly citing him. But much more importantly, this is one of the very few instances where we might get a historical detail about Jesus' life coming not just from gospel texts, but from oral tradition, going back all the way to Jesus' actual disciples. But the issue is, of course, that Luke 3.1 dates the prophetic activity of John the Baptist to the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, or the year 29. If Jesus was around 30 years old at the time, and he was crucified when he was almost 50, that would place his crucifixion around the year 48, during the reign of Claudius, when both Pontius Pilate and the high priests Caiaphas and Annas were long gone. That would mean that Jesus' crucifixion most dated not only the death of Herod Antipas, who questions Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, but even of Herod Agrippa, who executed Jesus' brother James, imprisoned Peter, and died in Acts 12. And just to be perfectly clear, in his demonstration of the apostolic preaching, Irenaeus wrote point blank that Jesus was crucified in the reign of Claudius. This shows that just because Irenaeus can be placed in a line of oral transmission, going back to a disciple of Jesus, that doesn't mean that we can automatically assume which pieces of information would actually be transmitted. Not only we see Irenaeus again reverse engineering history out of the gospel texts themselves, but we even see the presbyters, whom he appeals to for support, apparently cheering him on. And look, I'm sure that Irenaeus was absolutely horrified when he saw Christians who believed that the Pleroma consists of an Ogdode, a Decad, and a Duodecad, 
And I totally sympathize with him. I also 100% believe him when he says that these doctrines were not handed down to him by apostles or presbyters. But just like we can't, apparently, assume that Irenaeus would get even basic biographical details of Jesus' life right, we also cannot automatically assume that he would be in a good position to know who wrote the Gospels if the traditional authorship is false. Finally, it has been noted by scholars like Richard Bauckham, if the Gospels were truly anonymous early on, we should expect Church Father commentary on their authorship to resemble the talk on the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is truly an anonymous work, and instead of the Church picking an author to attribute it to, they debated on who wrote it and suggested different authors. P46 implies Paul was the author, Tertullian attributed it to Barnabas. Eusebius wrote that Origen said Paul was the author. Others attributed it to Clement of Rome or Luke. As Gathercole says, this sort of diversity is exactly what we do not find in references to the authorship of the Gospels. Instead, we have unanimous agreement, not church fathers trying to figure out who wrote anonymous biographies. Again, you would think that the epistle to the Hebrews being attributed to four different authors within the first like 200 years after it was written should decrease your confidence in these authors having reliable information about authorship of supposedly apostolic works. But that's apparently not the case. Like five minutes earlier, Michael claimed that whoever received the letter would request information about where it came from. So did the original audience of Hebrews not know who wrote it? Or did they forget, kind of like Mark forgot Peter preaching about Jesus' post-resurrection appearances? But facetiousness aside, Polkam and other scholars who make the same point fail to ask, whether what we see in the case of Hebrews is typical or exceptional. And it is exceptional. When a literary work from antiquity is falsely attributed, it is, in most cases, only ever attributed to one author. Just pick a random falsely attributed ancient work and check its reception history. I'm willing to bet a very large amount of money that what you're going to see is only one authorial claim ever being made. There are, of course, exceptions. For example, the Gospel of John, as we've discussed or a very obscure work called Dialogue of Jason and Papiscus. Maximus the Confessor claims that Clement of Alexandria attributed it to Luke, but Maximus himself to Aristo of Tella. But this is again an exception, not the norm. For every ancient work that was falsely attributed to multiple different authors, there are several with only one false attribution. Uniformity of authorial attribution is, in and of itself, no indication either in favor or against that attribution being correct, because we see it in falsely attributed ancient works all the time. But also we should note, it seems that the names attached to the Gospels would be unlikely picks of later forgers. Matthew is a Gospel that is for evangelizing the Jewish people, but it was attributed to a tax collector, which was a despised profession among the Jews. It is also unlikely that the Gospel was attributed to him on the basis of the references to him in verse 9, 9, and 10, 3, given how much of a minor role he plays throughout his gospel. Mark and Luke were only followers of the disciples, not direct disciples of Jesus. It would make no sense to attribute gospels to men who were never close with Jesus. Why not attribute the gospel of Mark to Peter, which tradition says was Mark's main source? Why would you pick two people as gospel authors who were not direct disciples of Jesus? Only the last gospel is attributed to a close disciple of Jesus. Given this, there's no reason to think forgers from the second century would pick Mark or Luke as gospel authors, or a tax collector as the author of the gospel for the Jewish people. The claim that the traditional authors would be unlikely later picks has of course been addressed many times. I'd like to point out that this, again, cannot make sense of the actual history of ancient Christian literature. Specifically, we see apocryphal works falsely attributed or even forged in the names of much more obscure figures than the four traditional authors. We can likewise ask, why would someone attribute a text to Matthias or Prochorus? And yet, that's what we see all the time. But let's roleplay this. Let's imagine that we are a Christian living in Rome at some point in mid-2nd century, and we are preparing a collection of texts for joint publication. We are aware that the texts are very similar in terms of content, so we decide to differentiate between them using the standard formula kata plus personal names of those responsible for the different versions in the accusative case. And let's say that we are honestly interested in identifying the most probable authors to the best of our abilities. If all already discussed how the author of the Gospel of John would have been identified. Then, there is this two-volume work in which the author, clearly a companion of Paul, talks about himself in the first person, which means that he can't be any of the characters identified by name in the text and spoken about in the third person. This actually rules out a lot of potential candidates among the Pauline companions, including, for example, Timothy, Titus, Barnabas, Silvanus, Erastus, and so on. But what is this? 
a letter in which Paul, shortly before his death, says that others have deserted him and only Luke is with me? Well, that's exactly the candidate who would be picked. So, two texts down, two more to go. By mid-2nd century, a Christian editor in Rome would know a tradition about Mark and Matthew being literary authors. But is there any clue about who wrote which text? Oh, curiously, two of the three texts that narrate the call of the tax collector call him Levi, but one conspicuously changes the name to Matthew. Could it be because this text was actually written by Matthew? If yes, then the last text must be by Mark, and we are done. And if you think that the last move, i.e. identifying Matthew based just on the name change, is not very persuasive because Matthew is such a minor character, well, it's actually pretty close to what conservative Christian scholar Richard Bokan proposes. He says that the author of the Gospel of Matthew deliberately changed the name of the apostle from Levi to Matthew in order to communicate that this apostle is the eyewitness behind the Gospel and that this subtle change was enough for the audience to get it. So when we survey the data, there is no reason to deny the traditional authorship of the Gospels. So. We've already discussed how the theory that the four canonical Gospels always had the surviving titles cannot make sense of the actual history of ancient Christianity and the development of ancient Christian literature, how it doesn't line up with ancient historiographical practices of reporting eyewitness testimony and with ancient practices of assigning titles to literary works. And we've also showed that ancient Christian writers didn't have a very clear idea about authorship of supposedly apostolic works and that when they open their mouths about it, the chance of them being correct is literally worse than a coin flip. But I want to close this video by highlighting even more positive internal evidence against the traditional gospel authorship. Most people are aware that the Gospels of Matthew and Luke are basically edited versions of the Gospel of Mark with additions, and that this is difficult to square with the theory of traditional authorship. You know, there is this usual talking point about why would Matthew copy-paste the story about his own call to discipleship from a different book instead of telling it in his own words. But the situation is in fact much worse than that. We of course don't see ancient eyewitness accounts that would just copy each other word for word. And we don't even see this when it comes to literary authors using existing accounts as sources. For example, when Plutarch cites Thucydides or Polybius, he doesn't just copy what they wrote and make changes here and there. So where do we see this extreme level of literary dependence elsewhere in ancient literature? Well, it's not between multiple eyewitness accounts, that's for sure. And it's rarely seen even between multiple literary works. When we see it, we see it between different textual recensions of the same literary work. In other words, we see it when an ancient author takes an existing text and rewrites it because he thinks he can do a better job. This is the case with various textual recensions of ancient historical fiction or with Christian apocrypha like the Acts of Barnabas, the Apocalypse of Thomas or the decapitation of John the Forerunner and so on. These are texts that kept being rewritten, redacted, expanded and so on. And we can see it because we have these recensions preserved in various manuscript families that have similar degrees of overlap in terms of content and often exact wording as the three synoptic gospels. Differences between the gospels of Matthew and Luke and the gospel of Mark are not random differences in recollection of multiple eyewitnesses. They exhibit a consistent pattern, a reductional profile, which reveals what their authors didn't like about the gospel of Mark and wanted to change. For example, Matthew putting in pop culture references to the Hebrew Bible or throwing out all the instances of Jesus practicing ancient magic, like spitting on people, touching their tongues, putting fingers into their ears and stuff like that. Or we can see them systematically expunging material from the Gospel of Mark so that their own soft reboot stays internally coherent. For example, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells his disciples that he will go ahead of them into Galilee after he's raised, and the young man inside the vacated tomb tells the women to go tell the disciples that Jesus was going ahead of them to Galilee. The author of the Gospel of Luke had a copy of the Gospel of Mark opened before him. He looked at these two passages, he thought to himself, hmm, do I want to copy this into my own text, just like I'm copying other things, or do I want to erase it? And he made the deliberate choice of erasing it. And why did he do that? Well, 
because in the cinematic universe of the Gospel of Luke, nobody goes to Galilee. All the appearances take place in Jerusalem. And so it makes no sense for Jesus or the young man to say that. And so the author of the Gospel of Luke struck it from the record. He was not recording eyewitness testimony. He was a Hollywood script doctor punching up a movie script. And this process, of course, didn't stop when he put down his stylus. It continued. And that's why, for example, the Gospel of John is visibly a patchwork quilt. Why we have like five different endings of the Gospel of Mark. Why there are two different versions of the Book of Acts. One about 10% longer than the other. Why in various late ancient or even later New Testament codices, speeches of Jesus suddenly contain extra sentences or even entire paragraphs missing from other manuscripts. That's why we have material wandering around several gospels in surviving manuscripts, like the pericope of the adulterous woman, which shows up in Luke before eventually settling down in John. That's why Tatian wrote the diatessaron. He wasn't satisfied with there being four separate Gospels, and so he rewrote them into just one Gospel, which actually replaced the canonical Gospels in various Syriac churches until like the 5th century. And people were of course aware of this already in antiquity. For example, Augustine proved to be a keen textual critic, just like Dionysius of Alexandria before him, as we've seen. Augustine realized that the synoptics are just rewrites of each other, and so he came up with his own theory of the origin of the Gospel of Mark. We can call it, let's say, the Augustinian hypothesis. Instead of Mark writing down whatsoever he remembered of the preaching of Peter, Augustine claimed that Mark actually followed Matthew and shortened his Gospel mostly by throwing things out. And notice that this video is over an hour long, and I haven't even mentioned all the various other pieces of evidence. For example, how the traditional gospel writers, as they are depicted in the gospels themselves, are unlikely to be literary authors, how they make mistakes about events that they supposedly witnessed, like Matthew and John misunderstood poetic parallelisms in the Hebrew Bible, and so they depicted Jesus as writing to animals, or soldiers both dividing his clothes and casting lots for them. I didn't mention any of the arguments that various scholars have proposed for dating the Gospels very late, like Luke using Josephus, the fact that there is no concrete evidence of the existence of the Gospel of Luke before the turn of the second century, and of the existence of Acts of the Apostles before mid-2nd century. I didn't mention any of the anachronisms, historical errors, gaps in knowledge that the traditional authors would have had, all the various contradictions between the four Gospels, and stuff like that. It's of course possible to explain all of this away with harmonizations and speculation. I can do that as well. But that leads to two issues. First, if you do that, you're doing nothing other than what ancient Christian apologists were doing already. And they were doing it because they didn't know any better. And second, you can only make all the inconvenient facts I've mentioned go away by positing an extremely large amount of ad hoc auxiliary hypotheses. This would turn your overall theory of Christian origins into an extremely convoluted Rube Goldberg machine of fringe positions propping up other fringe positions. My view is more plausible because it better coheres with what we already know about early Christianity and the ancient Mediterranean world in general. It has greater explanatory scope and explanatory power, because it can better explain more disparate pieces of evidence. And it's less ad hoc, because it doesn't have to be gerrymandered around the data by a lot of auxiliary hypotheses, many of which are themselves either implausible, unevidenced, or both. It just is a better explanation. This is the reason why scholars reject the view that the surviving titles are original to the four canonical gospels. And what I've been arguing is of course not original to me. Other people have already looked into this. Scholars who are much smarter, much more well-read, and much more skilled than either me or Michael. People who have spent 30, 40, 50 years doing New Testament scholarship full-time. And what they concluded just doesn't bear out what Michael says. And these people include even scholars who literally believe that Jesus Christ is their personal Lord and Savior, and that the four canonical Gospels are his divine scriptures, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So after all that, I think we're still at the same conclusion of my holy book video. While we may never definitively know the true authors, it is highly unlikely that Matthew, Mark, Luke, 
or John, wrote the Gospels attributed to them. Once again, Camille has brought us a masterclass of historical analysis. And if you've not yet heard enough, tap on the thumbnail on screen now for the presentation of his recent peer-reviewed academic paper exposing the fallacy of New Testament name affirmation. Happy New Year, and I'll see you over there. Until next time, later.